On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain is watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Congratulations to GB News Breakfast, voted by you as the nation's best multi-channel news programme at the prestigious Trick Awards. Good morning and welcome to Sunday with Michael Portillo. A morning and midday mosey through the latest arts and entertainment, as well as some ethical and political quandaries. The first of those today concerns the National Health Service. The government hopes to transform its quality of patient care with a long-term plan to boost the workforce. Will that be enough? Will we ever reach a point where politicians could moot the idea of reforming the provision of health care in Britain? The Prince of Wales has said that it's his life's work to eradicate homelessness. But is that within his realm, or does it carry the crown into politics? BBC former royal correspondent Michael Cole, who remembers the prince as a boy being taken to centre point by his late mother, will give his analysis. And as we mark 50 years since the death of Nancy Mitford, author, journalist, biographer, and perhaps the senior of the... Uh, Mitford sisters, I'm pleased to say that we have not only the author of the wonderful Mitford Murders uh, joining us to discuss her legacy, but also Nancy's niece and nephew to share some of their anecdotes about this remote and yet somehow familiar figure. On top of that, Julian Lloyd Webber will try to put a price on sound, having visited one of the world's foremost violin makers to discover what makes one instrument worth a few thousand pounds and another several million. After that, we'll discuss how to encourage disadvantaged pupils from the state sector to enjoy and play classical music. After 12 o'clock, we'll be joined by Dr Rabbi Jonathan Romaine, who's the chair of Dignity in Dying. He'll explain why he believes that his campaign to legalise assisted dying doesn't contradict his Jewish faith. First, the news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Thank you, Michael. Good morning to you. It is two minutes past 11 here in the GB newsroom. More than 700 people have been arrested in France following a fifth night of rioting. A tear gas was used to disperse crowds in Marseille, where police clashed with protesters late into the night. It follows the death of teenager Nahel Merzouk, who was shot by police during a traffic stop in Paris on Tuesday. There was a huge police presence in the capital, protecting the Champs-Élysées. In the suburbs, a mayor's home was ram-raided and set alight. His wife and one of his children were hurt. Prosecutors say an attempted murder investigation has been opened. Journalist Peter Allen, who is in Paris, believes a state of emergency could still be declared. Daniel Macron keeps announcing extra police every night. He's up to 45,000 extra police each evening. He's going to run out of policemen soon to, to, to push out. So then he brings in the army. It's, a state, it's certainly a state of crisis at the moment. And uh, his next step would probably be to introduce a state of emergency unless there's a massive change in the public consciousness and, and the rioting stops some other way. New measures to crack down on environmental activists come into force today. British Transport and Ministry of Defence Police now have expanded powers to move on static protests. Tunnelling or being present in a tunnel to cause disruption will become a new criminal offence, which could result in up to three years in jail. The Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, says the new measures are necessary to deal with mayhem on the streets. Environmental campaigners, though, like Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion, say it threatens their right to protest. Labour says it would give teachers in England £2,400 to stop them leaving the profession. The party is promising £50 million a year to stop what it calls an exodus funded by ending tax breaks for private schools. Nearly one in five teachers who qualified in 2020 have since quit. The Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson says the problem needs to be addressed. 
for our new teachers when they've completed uh, their early career framework, when they finish those two years, they would then receive a retention payment at the end of that. The single biggest way that we make sure that children get really great outcomes and get a great start in life in school is through high quality teaching. And right now at the moment, we face a recruitment and retention crisis across the profession. People are leaving teaching in their droves. One in five new teachers leave within uh, the first couple of years. And that's why I believe it's absolutely essential that we address that. Rail passengers are facing more disruption over the coming week. Aslef members at 16 train companies in England will refuse to work overtime, which operators rely on to run their full timetable. The union says it's calling for fair pay, but the rail delivery group says Aslef rejected its last offer of a £5,000 raise, which would bring the basic salary for drivers working a four-day week to nearly £65,000. Services will be affected from Monday to Saturday. The NHS has seen a steep rise in its demand for gambling addiction services. Health officials are particularly concerned about touch-of-a-button bets, with children and adults being bombarded with gambling adverts. New specialist clinics are being opened across the country after nearly 1,400 patients were referred last year. NHS England boss Amanda Pritchard says it is a cruel disease which destroys lives. And Twitter has applied a temporary limit to the number of tweets users can read in a day. The owner, Elon Musk, announced via Twitter that verified accounts can read up to 6,000 posts per day, but unverified accounts are limited to 600 posts, and newly unverified accounts can only see 300 posts per day. He says the temporary limits are to address uh, what he has described as extreme levels of data scraping, that is, uh, something that involves pulling information from a website into a spreadsheet, as well as system manipulation. This is GB News. More as it happens in our later bulletins, but now it is back to Michael. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Rishi Sunak has unveiled his plan to boost the NHS workforce, doubling university places for medical students and creating a new apprenticeship scheme for doctors. The announcement coincides with a report from the King's Fund showing that the NHS is lagging behind other European systems in preventing deaths. Even the Labour Party spokesman, Wes Streeting, admits that more money alone won't fix the NHS's problems. Is it becoming more possible for politicians to admit that structural reform is needed? To discuss this, I'm joined by two doctors with a combined experience of six decades in the National Health Service. Dr John Mahoney from uh, Plymouth is also a Conservative councillor who ran the city's health and social care system, while Dr Bob Gill works in Sidcup and produced the film The Great NHS Heist. Uh, I also have with me Christopher Snowden from the Institute of Economic Affairs and former Labour parliamentary candidate Kevin Craig. Uh, Dr. Bob Gill, I wonder whether I might start with you. What uh, did the title of your book, The NHS Heist, mean? Uh, it was a documentary. It's available on YouTube. And what we did was study the policy stream that's flowed out of Westminster for the last four decades. And what we've had is a cross-party consensus to buy stealth, transform, repurpose the NHS along the American uh, model lines. And that's that's essentially been done through successive legislation. We had the Health and Social Care Act in 2012, which broke the NHS up into clinical commissioning groups, took away the legal duty of the Secretary of State to provide health care, and also decimated and started to shut down uh, hospital services on the back of the financial crash imposed austerity on the NHS. Um, and in last year, the 2022 Act has created new legal entities called integrated care systems, which are essentially managed care systems with fixed budgets, so private corporations can run these essentially by making profit by denial of care and keeping the wage bill down. That's essentially what's happened over the last four decades. Um, Dr John Mahoney, do you uh, recognise that description? I mean, it certainly strikes me as extremely odd that apparently we put more into our health system uh, per capita than the OECD average, and yet it seems that the pay of doctors is now lagging way behind where it was 10 or 15 years ago. Do you recognise what you've just heard from Bob Gill? 
I, I, I don't recognise a lot of it. I mean, you're quite right, Michael. More money is going into the NHS than ever before, and the productivity seems to be declining post-COVID. I think there are lots of reasons for this. I think the pay of doctors is, is a slightly separate issue altogether. Uh, but I do think that the NHS has to be streamlined from the point of contact with GPs, which is problematic at the moment, to actually getting the treatment delivered. And actually, whether it is delivered within an NHS hospital or whether some of it either the investigations or the treatment is outsourced but paid for by the NHS. We have a community interest company that does lots of surgery in Plymouth. I think it was set up by Tony Blair and his government um, 20 years ago. So there are lots of ways of managing this, but I don't think the NHS at the moment is managing its, its money and its services very appropriately. Uh, Dr Mahoney, just to stick with you for a moment, why are people finding it so difficult to see their GP in the way that they used to? I don't know. I was a GP for nearly 30 years and I have been retired for 10 years. I think the virtual methods of consultation have their place, but they are not exclusively the best way of doing things. And actually, at some point, a lot of patients need to be examined. And they seem to have to jump through hoops of e-consults and triage before they get seen, when it's probably is obvious from the beginning that they need to be seen and examined. Follow-ups and other consultations can take place over the phone or or by by, by the media we're using now, or whatever. Uh, but but GP uh, G, people are getting the impression that GPs are becoming very inaccessible, and the worry is, of course, is the less vocal people and perhaps the more socially disadvantaged will be those who suffer the most with not being able to gain access, or alternatively, they just turn up in A and E, which um, or call an ambulance, which has been a big problem. Um, Chris Snowden, let's hear from a non-medical uh, voice. Uh, why is it that we spend more than the OECD average on our health service and get worse outcomes and find that our doctors are so poorly paid that many of them are moving abroad? Well, fundamentally, there's a lack of competition in the in the healthcare markets. I mean, you have this enormous state-owned, state-run leviathan, and these things tend to be very inefficient. I would love to know where the money is going. I would love to know why we have... Uh, far fewer doctors than comparable countries, why we're spending more than comparable countries. Uh, as you say, why, why are these people not being paid as much as they were 15 years ago, even though in real terms the NHS, NHS budget has uh, risen enormously? It just seems that there is an enormous amount of waste in the system. It's very inefficient. People just don't have the incentive, I'm afraid, um, to to provide a service efficiently because there's there's what's what, what, what alternative do patients have? What realistic choice do, do patients have um, when the state owns the entire thing? Uh, one answer, Chris Snowden, as to where the money is going might be provided by the government. It says that by spending £2.6 billion on this, uh, this new training system, it will save £10 billion. Uh, that's the money that presently is being paid to agency staff, because, of course, you pay a very large commission on agency staff. And, and that made me wonder whether, actually, pursuing that further, if we paid the doctors better, uh, perhaps we would save money because fewer of them would leave the health service. Yeah, I mean, that is quite possibly true. And certainly there is a big problem with um, people leaving the service and then coming back as private consultants or, or locums and so on. I mean, the whole thing is being exploited at all sorts of different levels because um, because the opportunity exists there. And it's a bad system for patients. It's a bad system also for staff. You know, we've got the, the doctors and nurses going on strike at the moment, um, which is obviously terrible for for patients, we already have millions of people on waiting lists. Um, but if we had competition within the, the, the system, if we didn't have so many state-owned hospitals, we have more state-owned hospitals than Spain, Italy and Germany combined. There's no, there's never been any reason why the government should have to own the infrastructure, have, own the hospitals themselves in order to provide universal health care. That's the great fallacy. That's a great misunderstanding amongst the British people, is they think you need to have the state owning and running everything in order to get healthcare free at the point of use. And you don't. You can look across Europe, all sorts of different systems work much better without having so much state involvement. Um, Kevin Craig, do you get the impression that the Labour Party has looked across Europe, looked across the world, looked at different systems, and whether the Labour Party might be interested in bringing in reforms, not just uh, more money or more training, but actually changing the way we do things in the health service? 
Yeah, yes, I do, Michael. And I think both West Streeting and Keir Starmer are, are really clear that the, the answer is in part financial. That's why there are very clear pledges on, on more money for the NHS through changes to, a, the, for example, the taxation of high net worth individual uh, non-DOMs. But also why I'm really encouraged by West Streeting every time he opens his mouth is that he, he's clear that, you know, ref, the reform has to come and ideology won't be put in front of, of parental choice and I understand why there's some nervousness about around some people about more use of private companies but if that helps clear backlogs then you know Labour's going to look at it and also you you made a very good point Michael about where is the money going the agency uh, cost is I've talked about it on this channel before criminally large and we can fix that very quickly and also the use of technology which the BMA and one of the other participants this morning has alluded to can really change how things happen because ultimately and people across politics I think agree with this your experience at the moment of the NHS trying to see a GP is is difficult you know if you haven't got the means to go private there's an 8am rush on Thursdays and yes the, the, the Labour Party under West Street and Keir Starmer is very very open to to doing what it takes to keep the NHS free at the point of use for all but make it work better um, doc, Dr Bob Gill, we started with you. Let's go back to you for a last word. Um, it doesn't sound like our other participants today recognise the picture that you paint of this sort of massive privatisation. Indeed, uh, we're being reminded there by Chris Snowden that Britain owns more hospitals at the state level than uh, the combination of three other countries. And also, we're hearing from uh, Kevin Craig that the Labour Party is likely to be open to reform, uh, which I think probably means more partnership between the private and public sector. I wonder, Bob Gill, whether you're a bit disappointed with this. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed, but not surprised. There, there is a political consensus to, to continue the repurposing of the NHS. In terms of cost, where is the money going? Well, neither of your other contributors talked about private finance initiative, which is a massive financial millstone. Nobody talks about the cost of marketization. The running, the overhead for the NHS pre satcher reforms was 4%. Now it's running close to 20%. And the American system we're following is 36% overhead. That means money being siphoned away from the pa patient delivery. In terms of competition, we know competition in healthcare, which is a natural monopoly, doesn't work. When you've had your heart attack, you're not going to compete to uh, which A&E department you go to. When you when you're, the private sector is interested in cheap, profitable care, they're not interested in intensive care, they're not interested in casualty, they're not interested in high-risk patients. So we've seen in America the most privatized system the state has to step in because of private sector failure, because they don't want to look after the poor and the very sick. Oh. So the ideology that is on display here is consistent with the betrayal of the public interest. Um, thank you to you all. I, I love the hint there that things were better under Margaret Thatcher, which is probably not the principal point that Bob Gill wanted to leave us with. But thank you to all. John M Maloney, Please, Dr Thatcher. Bob Gill, uh, Kevin Craig and Chris Snowden. You're watching Mike Portillo on GB News, Britain's news channel. After the break, we'll have the former BBC royal correspondent Michael Cole on the Prince of Wales's pledge to end homelessness. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel.
Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Uh, just over a month after swearing his loyalty, faith and truth to his king and father at the coronation service, the Prince of Wales has made a pledge to the country that he will make homelessness in Britain rare, brief and unrepeated. The Prince says it's his life's work to eradicate homelessness in the six pilot areas where he's launched his new campaign, Homewards. Each area will receive half a million pounds of seed funding from the Royal Foundation and will be expected to deliver new housing projects. William was taken as a child to Centre Point, the charity for young homeless people by his mother, Princess Diana. And one of my guests was there at the time, Michael Cole, formerly Royal Correspondent of the BBC. I'm also pleased to be joined by Matt Downey, the Chief Executive of Crisis. And I'll start with Matt, if I may, um, who I believe, Matt, you have had discussions with the Prince of Wales about the project. How did you gauge the level of his commitment? Well, I went into the discussions with him knowing that he already had a commitment, as you say. He's a patron of two wonderful homelessness organisations um, and has talked about this issue behind the scenes for a number of years, actually. And, and you know, during the pandemic, he was involved in some of the discussions uh, around the response to homelessness. Um, so, uh, you know, government ministers know he cares about this issue uh, behind the scenes. Anyone in the, in the homelessness sector knows that he cares about this issue. And, and really now the rest of the country knows. So I was able to speak to him about it. And, and you really can tell the difference when you're speaking to somebody who cares about this issue uh, compared to some people who might just want to associate with it for a, a fleeting moment or, you know, have a, a piece of PR around it so it's definitely genuine um and you know that's for us this is a great moment to see the issue having more profile um michael cole uh, the the question of homelessness has been pretty uh, prominent for i would say about four decades um i remember tony blair pledged to deal with it uh, but as far as i'm aware the problem considered uh, has continued uh, why would the prince of wales be able to solve a problem which politicians have not been able to solve in 40 years? 
Well, as you know, Michael, better than anybody, every major question is at its heart political. And if you delve a little bit deeper after that, it becomes theological. So everything the prince says and does will be looked at through a political prism. But this, as the previous speaker said, is not a whim on his part. It's not something he's come to lately. He was only 11 years old when he also went to The Passage, which was another brilliant homelessness uh, tra uh, uh, a charity set up by the late um, Cardinal Basil Hume, who I had the pleasure of knowing slightly and interviewing on two occasions. And he's been committed to that. Uh, and it is an issue which transcends politics because all the major political politics are committed to eradicating homelessness. And he can go into this with quite a great deal of confidence. And let's look at really what we're talking about. Look at him here. He is a good man. It's demonstrably true that he is. He has good intentions, uh, and that's a good start in an heir to the throne. Uh, he wants to do good things. He's not lazy. He's not self-indulgent. He's not a philanderer. He's not all the things that we've had <laughs> among our, our, our princes of the past. And I think that's to be welcomed. Um, I remember when he was growing up and becoming a teenager and becoming a bit lanky, I said to his mother, I said, you've, you've bred some height into the royal family. And she said, and good looks, Michael, and good looks. You know, and if we were to go to the William Morris Agency in Los Angeles, which has just signed up Prince Harry and Meghan Markle as clients, and we said to this agency, cast us a Prince Charming, well, they might come up with somebody very much like uh, Prince William. So my, 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 he has my. the mean, he has the means, and he has the he has the 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 commitment to do it. And he's got one hundred and thirty thousand acres of, of the Duchy of Cornwall. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm sure he's a very nice man, and I'm sure he's got lots of good intentions. But I'm, I'm not sure I've heard yet how he's going to be able to solve a problem which has defied politicians for four decades. Matt Downey, how can he solve a problem that has defied politicians for forty years? So I don't, I don't think we should pretend that uh, the, the Prince of Wales has the ability to uh, transform the housing landscape of this country. That does take politicians. It takes political choices. And, you know, quite frankly, until there's enough places for everyone to live, we'll have homelessness. Um, but what he can do uh, is two, two things that are really, really important. One is practical, and as you said in your introduction, he is helping six locations to do something different, to do something new, um, and to effectively try new ways of tackling this issue with some funding. The second thing is, and it won't have escaped your notice, that the language here is about ending homelessness. Um, it's not about managing it or putting up with it or kind of just tweaking the edges here, there, or, or you know, do, doing small things. This is about working backwards from a, a common shared aim that we should all have. And what he's doing in, in coming forward in this fashion is actually saying that's our task as a country. And to come together, whether you're a member of the royal family or a local authority or government or a housing provider or a charity, whatever, and say we need to organise around the solutions to this problem. So um, he can't do everything and he shouldn't do everything that's political. But what he can do is raise the bar of ambition in the country. Uh, an, inter an interesting discussion. I, I would say, um, in response to what we just said, Matt Downey, that you know he's he's speaking the language of political slogans. I, I think he is over-promising. I think you've more or less said that yourself. And that is, I think, what worries me. Uh, I don't think a royal should be involved in politics at all. But if he goes into politics over-promising, that seems to me to be quite full of danger. But unfortunately, we can't discuss that anymore at the moment. I thank you both, Matt Downey and uh, Michael Cole. Uh, Friday marked 50 years since the death of the senior Mitford sister. Nancy Mitford was a journalist, biographer and fiction writer. And although the world and society in which she lived, her life now seems remote to us, her work and her correspondence continue to delight readers today. Most recently, her first novel, The Pursuit of Love, was translated into a celebrated BBC drama. To discuss her life and legacy, I'm delighted to have with me Jessica Fellows, author of the Mitford Murders book series, as well as Nancy's nephew, Benjamin Trueheart, who joins me from Coventry. Uh, Benjamin, it's uh, a, a great pleasure to have a member of the family on the show. Uh, can you share with us uh, any memory that you have of Nancy Mitford? You must obviously have been uh, very young uh, when she died. 
Oh, it was only 60 years ago or something. I, I remember clearly. Uh, she gave me five pounds um, when I was visiting with my mom. Uh, when she, Decca was um, doing the final touches on her first uh, book, her first big book in the UK called uh, Hans and Rebels. And she dragged me along. And um, w one of the things we did was visit some of the relatives, uh, some of her, and. Uh, Nancy was great. You know, she gave me five pounds saying this is a tip for being a good boy. <laughs> and I, among our um, encounters, when we had a few after that, including one or two in the Rue Monsieur, which was her, her uh, French abode in Paris. I can't remember anything. I'm sorry to say. I'm hoping you get my sister on the line who knows everything about Nancy. Yes, we, we, we were hoping that your sister, uh, Dinky, would be on the line as well. Uh, and uh, just to explain, your mother was Decca, uh, Jessica, who was also um, a very remarkable um, writer. Uh, and we have Jessica Fellows with us too. Uh, how would you yeah. uh, uh, assess Nancy <laughs> Mitford, a, a, a remarkable author? How would I watch? Sorry, so, assess. Um, just a question, sorry. How would you assess Nancy Mitford? Oh, um, which I, I mean, she's always the one that I say is the one I, of all the sisters I probably would most like to have gone out for a martini with and a bit of a, you know, gossip. She was an incredibly acute observer of her class uh, and she was a very complicated woman and not always straightforwardly happy. But I feel like she was quite a pioneering woman for us because she was somebody who knew that she couldn't fit into a lot of society's expectations that had been in place when she was a young girl, pre-First World War. And what happened after the First World War was that so many women realised that they were not going to be able to get married. There simply weren't enough men to go around. And they were going to have to find some other means of, of forging ahead. And she did try to at first. She was very unhappily engaged to a man who was um, gay for many years. And then she was engaged to, and then she was married um, very sort of unsuccessfully and she wasn't able to have children which caused her great sadness uh, but I think when she had great success with her first novel after the Second World War she sort of saw a way to just live life the way that she was going wanted to and moved to Paris which she adored and had an affair with a sort of with a married man which maybe wasn't the best way ahead but she kind of she lived her life the way she wanted to she bought herself the most fabulous frocks she furnished her apartment beautifully and she wrote letters she was very aware of her abilities as a writer and she was kind of aware that her letters were almost like a historical document that they would be published in the future as they have been. And, you know, she was interesting. I mean, there were so many dynamics going on between those six sisters, uh, but she was the one who perhaps, I think, best recorded them. Um, Although, of course, your mum, <coughs> Jessica, did do the most fabulous book as well. And what was interesting is you saw that all of the sisters had slightly different recollections of their upbringing, but that's what history is. Um, Benjamin, think, um, uh, oh, Nancy Mitford wrote about uh, her family, your family. She wrote about uh, Uncle Matthew, who was actually um, her father. Uh, and um, he was a man with a volcanic temper who fulminated against Huns and foreigners. And, and of course, you know, it, Nancy Mitford was poking fun at this extraordinary figure. But recently now, we've had uh, trigger warnings about Nancy Mitford's work. How do you feel about that? Oh, I, it's ridiculous. Um, I think uh, tr trigger warnings um, um, about historical things are crazy. I, I was thinking of an analogy. Um, well, I, I don't know it doesn't strike me now, but um, it's crazy. I mean, these, these are people like my mum, and her sisters, they're all pretty good writers, including Devo, the Duchess of Devonshire. She was very funny and great uh, at writing, but I'm sure they said many incorrect things because of the time, you know. And so why, uh, in fact, my mother had a book of letters come out a few years ago, um, and right now they're reprinting it. Uh, it's called uh, uh, The Letters of Jessica Mitford. Um, and they're wanting to put trigger warnings throughout it. 
And the compiler of these letters is refusing to go along with it. And I think he's going to stop publication of the whole thing. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Benjamin Truhart and to Jessica Fellows for calling Nancy Mitford. After the break, Julian Lloyd Webber explores the art of violin making, what makes a Stradivarius so great that it's worth millions. Like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often there will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. Julian Lloyd Webber played the cello for half a century and would be the first to say that a performance is a double act between the player and the instrument. Just as musicians train to perfect their technical ability, the wood and the strings must yield to their instructions in order to convey the emotion of the performance. With that in mind, Julian visited the world-renowned violin maker Florian Leonard in London to find out why two instruments that might appear to the layperson much the same can vary in price from perhaps a few thousand pounds to tens of millions. So today we're in the shop, if that's the right word, of the world, sure. is it the right word? Um, of the world famous uh, string expert, Florian Leonard. And what we endeavor to show the viewers today is the difference between 
why one violin or why one cello should be worth far more money, basically, than another. Yeah. So we're going to start off, and, and to help us on our quest, we just happen to have two wonderful experts on their instruments. Um, this is Ellie Sue, who also happens to be Florian's wife, and this is Jiajing Lloyd Weber, who happens to be my wife. <laughs> and we're going to get to the bottom of this today. So what instruments, Ellie, you start off first. What, what have you got there? Hey, this is a Guarneri del Gesù. And um, yeah, shall I play Let's a hear bit? a few bars, yeah. That's your instrument, isn't it? Yes, that's the it's one I normally play. It's a wonderful, wonderful instrument. Yeah. When, how long have you had it? Um, a few years now. And Florian, would you want to put a valuation on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know that by today, any super violin from Made in Cremona around this golden era is a minimum of 10 million dollars or pounds or euros. That's a um, lot of money. But the Del Gesù goes way beyond that. How and far it breaches, beyond that? It breaches the 20 million, but we have to... Well, I mean, how would you describe the, the feeling of playing this violin? It really plays, uh, it feels like playing, playing on, uh, on a tool, which also is always collaborating with you and um, playing with you as well. But it's all about the player, isn't it? It doesn't actually play itself. I mean, there's that story yeah. of a, a lady going to Heifetz after a concert, saying, oh, your uh, maestro, your violin sounded wonderful. And he puts it to his ear and he says, that's strange, I can't hear a thing. <laughs> now, judging you have um, a particular cello. Which one is this, Flora? Oh, it's a Mariani from Pesaro. It's from the 17th century, super, super old. In all parts, original is quite, quite beautiful. And a valuation on this one? Much, much cheaper than a Del Gesù. It's uh, only, it's less than half a million, let's only. put it this way. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, what are you going to play us? <laughs> To me, that sounds, it's a lovely sound, but I'm not sure how big that would be in the concert hall. Am mm. I right in, in thinking that? Yeah. It sounds great in this room, it's a sweet sound, yeah. but in the hall it might not have quite enough yeah. power to reach the very back. So it, it reaches in a warm way uh, uh, the, 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 into the distance of a large hall, but it does, it's not comparable to Gofrella, Strad, Montagnana. So we've been talking millions here, Florian. So, mm -hmm. so what have we got now? This is a, the, the cheaper end of the market? Yeah, it's the right? cheaper end of the market. Anything that starts sounding quite well is from around 10,000 pounds onwards. And here we have two instruments in that range. And this is a Matthew Hardy. It's an English violin made around 1810. It's in lovely condition, sounds decent. Um, here we have a modern Italian violin, uh, a cello uh, from Cremona, also decent, beautiful sound. But you can ask the players later what they feel, how inspiring that might be and what is lacking. Okay, what's your reaction to that? Um, it, it lost uh, the deepness. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, it, and also... The bus. Yeah. Yeah, and to me it doesn't even have much projection. Yeah, it's just like a kind of a, on the surface. I love the warmth in the, in the violin. 
Um, it has a slightly um, slower response. To me, that's not a bad sound. It, it, it's strong. It's quite yeah. powerful, mm -hmm. um, but a bit thin. It has a little bit of a matchness mm -hmm. uh, in the sound, but I, I think it has a, a lot of warmth. Um, although it's not as good as the other one, but still, it's not bad. It's reasonable for that price. It's definitely worth it. <laughs> Okay. Now this is the grand finale here. We we got two grand wonderful wonderful instruments, and I must say, extremely expensive instruments. So yeah. so tell us about the cello. Yeah, I mean this is a Matteo Gofrilla. So Gofrilla is one of those uh, cello makers of of cellos for for the for cellists. Yes. That is a dream yes. instrument. And so. Um, Gofrilla is a, is a Venetian cello maker, and the Venetian cello makers like Montagnana and Gofrilla particular, in particular are very bass, strong instruments. They're, they're built in a certain way that they have width and depth in sound and brilliance at the top. Yes. Very, very useful and still not as, as, as expensive as a Stradivari. Oh, now let, let's, really let's sounds, get some figures here. You say really much sounds, cheaper. Yeah. How much okay, is this? this put uh, it in percentages. It's uh, maybe a quarter okay. of a Stradivari channel. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking several millions here. Yeah, and I maybe. haven't heard this yet. I'm looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. It's certainly Fantastic. a wonderful sound, but it's got quality. It all the depth. It's got too. the depth and the yeah. And the I can see why. I mean, one of the things about the instruments now is, of course, when they were made, you never had a microphone in front of it like this. Yeah. Um, so they need to be powerful in the hall, mm -hmm. and yet to sound good close up. Yeah, they have long sometimes. ranges. Yeah. So lo long waves that that transport out with a great core. So you have that clarity that you can, even in pianissimo, you can still hear it well. And I think it would be true to say that the players have to, the better an instrument is, the more they have to work with it and learn exactly. you know, how to get certain things out of it. It's like, like a relationship. Yes. You have all that overtone range. Yes. You discover in which place between the fingerboard and the bridge you, you keep the bow and which speed at which pressure and um, that gives different colors, but also dynamic range. And with a lesser instrument, it's, it's, it's doesn't, just it doesn't matter same. what you do. You it's can, nearly the same. Yeah. So Ellie, you now have a Stradivarius in your hands. Tell us about this one. It's, a, it's a, of the late period, uh, Stradivari, in really great condition. So this would be 1730s, 1720s? Yeah, it's in the 1730s. It's a violin that's still made by the 92-year-old Stradivari, incredible. And you can still see his handwriting in it. It's so strong and powerful. You can virtually feel it was built by, the, by a virtuoso who, who nearly built it blindly. He had, he had such security and sh certainty in yeah. expression. What are you gonna play us? Uh, I'll play a little bit of the Waxman's Carmen Fantasy. Okay. My is that is different class. The thing I always find extraordinary about these instruments is that when they were made, the makers had no idea that they'd be played in a place like the Albert Hall. You know, what is it that makes them still the best today? Incredible, yeah. And and on top of that, they're not even anymore in the original setup. They have a different neck angle. They have a longer fingerboard. They have a longer bass bar, a stronger bass bar, different bridge and different strings even though they have been altered all that way and are being played in different concert halls than they were planned to be when, when they were first made in the Baroque era, in particular in Italy at, at first. 
um, they were built with materials that are everlasting and are really the best choice. That's what made them so impossibly difficult to, to, to copy so by, you're saying, by you're makers. Saying, you're saying they, you can't really get those materials today? You can occasionally get them, but it's not easy to be found. But what, what these guys in those days had, they had a feeling how to select the best materials. People in those days woke up with the sunrise and went to bed with sunset. They didn't have a light switch to click, mm -hmm. flick the light on, and they didn't have a, a stereo uh, to just uh, switch on the radio. And so the people had different feelings for things. They could feel and sense more than we can to detect today. I myself trained at least for 25 years at the beginning of my career to, to feel the difference of different pieces of wood that you would select. So yeah. do you mean that our present day technology is actually, um, we've lost something? We really hinder some access to it. Yeah. yeah, I personally, when I went to violin making school, we learned to see in the computer how the vibrations go in the violin, how in a different slow down, enlarged amplitude, the violin distorts and where it vibrates at which mode, at which frequency level, etc., and how how much amplitude the the, the vibration have. Which surely to... must make the whole thing much easier. You think that exactly, but but you know the translation of these computer models into the hands into the wood still needs to take place, and that's a very difficult thing. So I very early decided. Okay, I understand this now. I, I see roughly how an instrument vibrates and which frequency it should vibrate less and where more so that you, for example, don't have an instrument that sounds nasal. So you want a brilliance and a depth and you don't want just a middle sounding. So um, I decided to try to, to slip back into nature. I tried to, 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 to compare millions of pieces of wood and see the result of vibration. You know, you pick it up, you have intuitive feeling. You know, when you touch, just for, for everybody in the street, if you, if you touch glass or knock on glass, it has a very high pitch, hard response to that knock, tink, tink. If you do that to a, a car tire, which is rubber, it's a totally muted bloop, bloop. And if you have in the middle plexiglass, you have a, Slightly dong dong, but it's not so great. If you then use metal, it's doing, it goes forever. And within wood, it's a much finer difference, but you have the same differences. So you want to pick that piece that doesn't mute too much, doesn't need too much effort to knock it, etc. So, so you, of course, you learn over time. Today is quite easy for me to pick it. Okay, let me put you really on the spot. In a hundred yeah. years' time, yep. will it still be the Stradivarius, or will somebody come along who who has all these benefits of all these computers and the way things should Very nice vibrate? question. Yeah. I love the question. Because, you know, I mean, first of all, we see that 300 years down the line, Stradivarius is still holding up. Even Amatis from 400 years ago are still going strong. And I would say Stradivari will always have his place because we all follow Stradivari anyway. He is the god because he has at the first found the best design, the best wood, the best ground, the best varnish, the, the best model, the best arching, the best thicknessing, and the most elegant speed in which he expressed his flow of making. So that's what we admire as a package. On top of that, that resulted in an outstanding sound. You do have other makers that are similarly good in, in different aspects, but Stradivari just covered them all. And that's why he's so celebrated today. Well, I'm sure we've all learned a lot today, Florian. So thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you, Ellie. And thank you, Josh Ching. So have you got something you can play us together on these wonderful instruments? Mm. Handel Halverson? Yeah. Passacaglia.
Gosh, what a glorious sound. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. That was Julian Lloyd Webber in conversation with um, Florian Leonard. Um, well, both Julian and his brother have been instrumental in supporting the musical education of young people. Just this week, Andrew Lloyd Webber has lamented that while 85% of private schools have an orchestra, the figure is just 12% in the state sector. Through his foundation and the Music in Secondary Schools Trust, he's hoping to change that. I'm delighted to be joined by the Chief Executive of the Trust, Rachel Lander. Welcome to GB News. Right. So, have, have things in the state school sector got quite a bit worse than they were? Yeah, I don't think uh, music is where it should be in state education currently. I think there's a few reasons for that. I think there's been a real um, priority towards STEM subjects. Mm. We've also seen the EBAC, which came in in 2010, which has sort of squeezed out the arts, making schools focus down on certain subjects, um, which has, you know, caused an issue. There's also been funding cuts. So, for example, at university art courses, they've been cut by 50%, and that funding has been reprioritised towards STEM subjects. Yes. I think this has led to a recruitment issue in the music sector, and with the disadvantaged schools that we see, there is a crisis where there aren't the high-quality teachers to teach music. And I think that those three things have had a, a big impact. If you look at GCSE and A-level now, there's been a 27% reduction in those students who take those courses. And I think it was in 2021, the music industry brought in four billion to the economy in the UK. Yeah. Um, tell me how you got involved in it, because I think that might help to exemplify what, what, what your trust does, what your organisation yeah, so does. Yes, I worked in a inner city London school and I wasn't actually a musician, but the MISS programme, it wasn't the MISS programme at the time, it was just a music programme that we wanted it to transform the school. And I saw this music programme in the school transform the school from a special measures school to good and to outstanding. I think the music in the school gave the school an identity. It, the ethos was just incredible. All these students with the violins and flutes having the opportunity to play music. We created a huge orchestra and from an orchestra you get team, you know, teamwork, communication, all of the, those different things. And I think the importance was it wasn't to create musicians, even though the MISC program does produce high quality musicians. It was to give all students that opportunity to play an instrument and to learn music and to get those skills that they need to thrive in life. What, what you said is fascinating because as you were saying that schools have been mm. focusing on STEM subjects, mm. I, I dare say a lot of people would say, well, that's the right thing to do. We've got to mm. make sure they're right. But you're saying that the teaching and learning of music in schools mm. has an impact across the board and improves the students' performance in other subjects. Yeah, well, we have some data to show that students who've been on the Andrew Lloyd Webber programme, which is our curriculum, have had an improvement of 10% in their self-confidence and self-resilience. We also have data, because we've been in these schools for over 10 years, to show that, you know, it, it does make a real difference in terms of academic-wise as well. The students are getting better academic results individually, but also the schools that we're in are having a higher Progress 8 score. So they're actually attaining more than really the students are supposed to. And you are focusing on schools in disadvantaged areas? Yes, we are. We focus on students, um, schools that have a higher than average pupil premium number. We believe that, you know, disadvantaged schools have got issues. They often aren't full. So if they don't have a full pan, they have budget deficits. You know, where do they get the money to buy classical musical instruments? We've got 80 schools on our waiting list all from all over the country and we just want to be able to reach them because, you know, we believe why should some children have a musical instrument and some students don't? And that figure of, you know, 12% in disadvantaged state schools having an orchestra and 85% in private schools having one, you know, that's fantastic for private school children, but why shouldn't, why shouldn't every child, you know, children from poor backgrounds, they really need music to help them. Music is just as important as maths, maths, you know, English. No one's saying that, yeah, you know, it should just be all music, but yeah, important. Uh, Rachel Landon, it's marvellous to hear your passion. Thank you. I I'm, I'm, think people have been very impressed by that. Well, that's it for this hour, but stay with us as it's uh, 12 o'clock and then we're going to have our ethical debate. This week we'll be talking about the Health and Social Care Committee's inquiry into assisted dying. Should the law be changed? How free should we be to choose the timing of our death?
and foremost, I am a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon and welcome back to Sunday with Michael Portillo. Acclimatise yourself for an hour of arts, food and conversation. The first half of which will consider two profound ethical quandaries. We're joined by Rabbi Dr Jonathan Romain, who's just been appointed the new chair of Dignity in Dying. He'll tell us why his campaign to legalise assisted dying doesn't contradict his Jewish faith. The Health and Social Care Committee is currently conducting an inquiry into the issue. Should we make it easier to die? Then we'll examine the ethical and political dilemma of obtaining justice for crimes committed during the Troubles in Northern Ireland. The Troubles are largely over, but the legacy is bitterly contested, and the government's bill to end all prosecutions of Troubles crimes has attracted a program in the province from different perspectives. We'll speak to two figures, one representing veterans and the other victims. In the second half of this hour, we'll consider an ethical puzzle of a somewhat lighter shade, should vegans date only other vegans. Our guest certainly thinks so, and not just because it's good for business. He's founded a fast-growing dating app that's designed to help vegans find animal and dairy-free love. 
And finally, a culinary rather than an ethical question to finish off. What's the difference between ice cream and gelato? I ventured to North London to find out. Stay with us for all of that. First, the latest news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Hello there, very good afternoon to you. It is four minutes past 12. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. More than 700 people have been arrested in France following a fifth night of rioting. Tear gas was used to disperse crowds in Marseille, where police clashed with protesters late into the night. It follows the death of teenager Nahel Merzouk, who was shot by police during a traffic stop on Tuesday in Paris. And there was a huge police presence in the capital, protecting the Champs-Élysées. President Macron will hold a crisis meeting with key members of his government at half past six. Journalist Peter Allen, who's in Paris, believes a state of emergency could yet be declared. Emmanuel Macron keeps announcing extra police every night. He's up to 45,000 extra police each evening. He's going to run out of policemen soon to, to, to push out. So then he brings in the army. It's, a state, it's certainly a state of crisis at the moment. And uh, his next step would probably be to introduce a state of emergency unless there's a massive change in the public consciousness and, and the writing stops some other way. New measures to crack down on environmental activists come into force today. British Transport and Ministry of Defence Police will have expanded powers to move on static protests, tunnelling or being present in a tunnel to cause disruption like HS2 will become a new criminal offence which could result in up to three years in jail. The Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, uh, says the new measures are necessary to deal with what she's described as mayhem on the streets. Environmental campaigners like Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion say it threatens their right to protest. Labour says it would give teachers in England £2,400 to stop them leaving the profession. The party's promising £50 million a year to prevent what it calls an exodus funded by ending tax breaks for private schools. And nearly one in five teachers who qualified in 2020 have since quit. The Shadow Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson, says the problem must be addressed. For our new teachers, when they've completed uh, their early career framework, when they finish those two years, they would then receive a retention payment at the end of that. The single biggest way that we make sure that children get really great outcomes and get a great start in life in school is through high quality teaching. And right now at the moment, we face a recruitment and retention crisis across the profession. People are leaving teaching in their droves. One in five new teachers leave within uh, the first couple of years. And that's why I believe it's absolutely essential that we address that. 13 animal rising protesters have been arrested for trying to disrupt the Greyhound Derby at Toaster Racecourse yesterday. Three activists broke into the circuit, uh, climbed scaffolding, in an attempt to prevent the Derby from happening. It is the biggest day in the Greyhound racing calendar. They were taken down before the event got underway. Ten protesters also tried to get onto the track, but were stopped by uh, Northamptonshire police. Officers also arrested three activists at their house on Friday ahead of the event. Two people have been killed and three are in critical condition after a mass shooting in the US state of Maryland. Uh, police say up to 30 people suffered gunshot wounds in the incident, which took place in the city of Baltimore, where people had gathered for an event called Brooklyn Day. Nothing is yet known about the shooter or a potential potential motive. Rail passengers are facing more disruption over the coming week. ASLEF members at 16 train companies in England will refuse to work overtime, which operators rely on to run their full timetable. The union says it's calling for fair pay, but the rail delivery group says ASLEF rejected its last offer of a £5,000 raise, which would bring the basic salary for drivers working a four-day week to nearly £65,000. Services will be affected from Monday to Saturday. The NHS has seen a steep rise in its demand for gambling addiction services. Health officials are particularly concerned about touch of a button bets, with children and adults being bombarded with gambling adverts. New specialist clinics are being opened across the country after nearly 1,400 patients were referred last year. NHS England boss Amanda Pritchard calls it a cruel disease which destroys lives. And Twitter's applied a temporary limit to the number of tweets users can read in a day. The owner, Elon Musk, announced via Twitter that verified accounts can read up to 6,000 posts per day, but unverified accounts are limited to 600 posts 
and newly unverified accounts can only see 300 per day. He says the temporary limits are to address what he calls extreme levels of data scraping, which involves pulling information from a website into a spreadsheet, as well as system manipulation. More as it happens here, as always, on GB News. But for the moment, it's back to Michael. Thank you, Aaron. The debate on assisted dying has sparked some of the most heart-rending debates in the House of Commons with highly personal contributions from politicians on all sides. The campaign to legalise assisted dying appears to be gathering momentum with the Health and Social Care Committee conducting an inquiry, but alarm has been expressed at examples in other jurisdictions. To discuss whether Britain should reform its laws, I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr Jonathan Romain, the new Chair of Dignity in Dying, and here in the studio, Dr. Mark Pickering, who's Chief Executive of the Christian Medical Fellowship. Um, so, Jonathan Romain, if I may um, begin with you, uh, you say that you are happy to... Ah, not sure, Jonathan. No, Jonathan's not hearing me, so I'll, I'll talk to uh, Mark Pickering. Um, in this country. Is that your position? Well, I think the, the big concerns is that when dignity in dying say we can have this tightly circumscribed law, um, mentally competent terminally adults with six months or less to, or less to live, you simply can't do that. You've already alluded to other jurisdictions. In Canada, they've gone in just a few years from terminal illness to chronic illness and disability. They're now talking about mature uh, minors under 18s, mental health conditions purely. It's like a runaway train. And um, that is the logical progression of things. And I think dignity in dying are either being naive or disingenuous when they pretend that you can keep it like that. Because if they have compassion for people who are suffering, then you can't limit that purely to terminally ill people. People like Paul Lamb, who suffered for 30 years in pain and disability after a road accident, campaigned to change the law so that he could have assisted dying. Dignity in dying refused to support him, same as Tony Nicholson. And I think when you see um, religious uh, people like Lord Carey, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, he admits that Tony Nicholson, Paul Lamb, they changed his mind and turned him into a supporter of assisted dying. But they are the very people who dignity in dying's campaign do not support. So my suggestion to them is that they become a little more honest and join their compatriots in groups like My Death, My Decision, who are openly campaigning for Can Canadian-style euthanasia for all adults who are suffering in this country. It's, it's a jolly messy situation, isn't it? I mean, I feel that I would like to choose the moment of my dying um, if, I, uh, if I were terminally ill, po possibly in other circumstances as well, I don't know. Uh, and because I have a fair amount of wealth, I'd be able to travel to Switzerland, I'd be able to pull this off. So, uh, I mean, the situation is very messy at the moment. Does it not at least need tidying up? Well, I think it's pretty good. I mean, we have a, a workable compromise at the moment. What's really been cruel and broken about our laws is that we haven't actually had legally mandated palliative care provision. That's only come in this year with the Health and Social Care Act, thanks to Baroness Finlay and her colleagues. And that, that really should have been campaigned about for a long time. Um, but I do think the you know, other jurisdiction should really give us pause for thought. And as you've said, you're wealthy, you're, you're used to exercising your autonomy. Most of the British people, the 540 who've gone to Dignitas in Switzerland, they are the company directors, they are the parliamentarians, the, the professionals who say, I'm used to calling the shots in my life, I want to have control over my death. But enabling those people to exercise their rights will take away the rights and the autonomy of people who don't have it already. The elderly, the vulnerable, people for whom English is a second language uh, and that sort of thing. We see that time and time again. I think we've got the line now to Rabbi um, Dr Jonathan Romain. Um, jo Jonathan, can, tell me um, how your position, both your moral position and the position you've taken, uh, is compatible with your Jewish faith. Oh, very much compatible because it's a religious response to help people. We help people all the time um, in every single way. And if people are dying in pain, 
um, and they say, look, I'm in agony, I've got Parkinson's motor neuron, cancer, whatever, will you please help let me go? Thank you God, it's been a great life so far, but I'm suffering awfully and I don't want to suffer for another three weeks. Uh, and you're right, it is a messy situation, because at the moment, um, the, the people who are suffering, and we're only talking about people who are suffering, if you want to carry on to your last breath, then great, that's wonderful. And there's wonderful nurses and palliative care, but they can't help everybody. And at the moment, if you if you are suffering, then you have to either go to Switzerland, which costs a lot of money, at least 10,000, or you commit suicide, which is awful, Often it's botched, and it's, if it's successful, it's horrible for the relatives left behind. Or you have to suffer on. And it's precisely because the current situation is so bad, we need to change it. And I, I think Mark was a little bit um, uh, disingenuous when he says we can't help everyone. Well, OK, that's true, but we can help some. And so although we can't help people who are not terminally ill, we can help those who are terminally ill. And that's a very religious red line, so that we're not shortening life. What we're doing is shortening death, because these are people who are about to die anyway. And it's also a little bit disingenuous to um, uh, quote Canada, because we're not interested in Canada. What we're really interested in is what happens in Oregon, and that's the system we want here. And I say that because they've been doing the same sort of thing for 25 years. In other words, we've got a quarter of a century's worth of evidence to show that, number one, it works, uh, and number two, it affects a very small number of people, only 0.6% of all deaths. So in other words, in, although a lot of people will apply, I mean thousands of people apply because they want to have that emotional safety net to know that if things go really, really horrible, then they can have a prescription. Actually, most of us will carry on to our dying day, our dying breath. But uh, for those who people who are uh, lacking dignity, pain, suffering, it's really important, it's religiously important that we give them that option. And that's what we're talking about, options. And we really need a whole package of options. We don't talk about death enough. So you can carry on, or you can have palliative care, or you have assisted dying. So it's about that freedom to choose. And of course, Mark can choose what he wants in Jonathan. his own death. Um, but we want to have other people to choose what they want for their death. Jonathan, some, some of the people who do decide uh, that their life should be ended um, comment that they feel like they're a burden. Mm. And this seems a vulnerability because uh, people like Mark Pickering, I think, are worried that if the law changes, too many people will be persuaded, either by themselves or by others, that they are a burden. And that becomes a new category, doesn't it? Uh, yes, and that's why I'm so keen to emphasise what's happened for the 25 years in, in Oregon, because the people who go there are people who are in control of their lives, um, are, are used to making their own decisions, and decide in advance this is what they want. Uh, no one's asking them to uh, pass away early. It's their choice. Um, and um, I, I think people have that right. It's a matter of freedom of choice. And, I, and I'm sure many listeners to you right now are remembering relatives who on their deathbed were saying, please let me go, can't you help me? And of course they couldn't because it was illegal. In fact, only the other day I was visiting someone in a hospice and the nurses were doing wonderful things for him, but he still said, every night I pray that I won't wake up in the morning and every morning I'm disappointed. So those people have a right to choose how to die. Jonathan. And I think it's a little bit arrogant to say, well, you've got to do it my way. Let's do it our own way. Each person has that option. Jonathan, that, 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 that is moving stuff. Let's put that to Mark Pickering. It, it, we're really talking here about a human right, and I would possibly say even a basic human right, to be able to choose the date of your death. How do you respond to that? Well, you've put it very eloquently, and I think Jonathan is sadly getting mixed up between Switzerland and Oregon. He's talking about people going to Oregon. No, he's talking about them going to Switzerland. And it is those people with high autonomy and that sort of thing. If, as the so you're not against that? Well, I think it's perhaps less worse than some things. There are less and bad... There, there are more and less bad options that we can take. But uh, as soon as you say that this is a fundamental human right, then that confers a duty upon the state. You're very familiar with this as a parliamentarian. As soon as we say that we must guarantee that right to people, we have to guarantee it to everybody. Every doctor will be duty-bound to, to say to every elderly and vulnerable person, I know you're having a tough time 
have you considered assisted dying because it's available on the NHS now? You could be sued for not talking about that if it is part of the package that's available. And Jonathan, you know, again, he talks about people in the last three weeks of their life. No, they talk about the last six months, actually, and yet, um, you know, where is the compassion for people like Paul Lamb who suffered for 30 years? If you're going to do it on compassion, you have to you have to you know, lay it wide open. And I think, again, that's just why Dignity and Dying are taking the politically expedient option. They're saying, what can we do that will maybe get it over the line in Parliament? And then they're going to step back and let others, like My Death, My Decision, campaign for the much broader thing. They're not going to campaign against it. It is a deeply complicated uh, moral and ethical question, and that's why I'm so pleased that we are debating it on GB News. Thank you very much to Rabbi Dr Jonathan Romain and Dr Mark Pickering here in the studio. In a few minutes, I'll be talking to a victims campaigner and a representative of veterans in Northern Ireland who are on opposite sides of the question how to obtain justice for those bereaved by the 30-year conflict there. Stay with us. Like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often, they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, The People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions, and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio, and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Welcome back. The legacy of the Troubles in Northern Ireland is bitterly contested. In the 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement, many members of the security forces feel that they've been hounded by official inquiries and investigations, while some former bombers and gunmen received assurances that they wouldn't face prosecution. Outrage over the treatment of ex-soldiers helped to propel Boris Johnson to introduce a bill effectively to end any prosecutions for Troubles-related crime. In return, perpetrators would engage in a truth recovery process to provide information to the families of those killed or injured.
Critics say that that amounts to an amnesty. And this week, the House of Lords voted to remove that clause. To explore the ramifications of this, I'm joined by victims campaigner Kenny Donaldson, director of the South East Fermanagh Foundation, and Danny Kinahan, a former Ulster Unionist MP and now Northern Ireland's Veterans Commissioner. Um, Danny, let me begin with you. Um, what has brought about this legislation? Uh, can it be effective and do you support it? Um, good afternoon, Michael, uh, and thank you. Um, what's brought the legislation about is the unfairness of the whole system at the moment, in that veterans um, see it's a very unbalanced situation against them. They've seen the Good Friday Agreement letting everyone out who'd been convicted. They'd seen some 365 royal pardons, some 300 letters of comfort, a mass of things all going down the other side to almost to the point where terrorists have been let off. Whereas in the last three years since my appointment, we've had three cases in court. All three have been um, veterans. We know there are some 26, I think, inquests coming, sorry, 36, of which 23 are against the state. So there's a real feeling that everything is against them and they wanted legislation. And also, if you talk to veterans, I think uh, we've done a questionnaire, 90% did not like where we were. But I would like to just add in that I, I don't really see myself at opposite sides um, with Kenny. We, we talk quite often and would work together to try and get to where we're getting. The I've had a many time talking to the government, lots of time talking to the government on this to try and make the legislation better. And I think it's better than where we started. Prosecution now is part of it when it wasn't at the beginning. Uh, there are lots of other changes still bubbling through the system. And we wait to see what the bill actually does when it gets to the Commons. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Kenny Donaldson, um, hearing the tone of Danny Kinahan just there, talking about the fact that you do talk about these subjects, um, he, just, he does paint a picture of a rather one-sided situation in which the veterans are still being pursued, but the bombers are not. Is, is that correct? Well, Michael, look, there's, there's plenty of what Danny has said there, and I'm not going to disagree with it. It's a statement of fact um, over a period of time. Um, but listen, I'm always of a view that we have to get behind why that has happened. And for 25 years, we haven't had peace in Northern Ireland. We've had an appeasement process within Northern Ireland. And there were things that were done which were covert and things that were done which were overt. The Belfast Agreement did have a support from the population, a majority support. And you could break it down well, that support extended within unionism or certainly as a population, the support was there. Then we have had since that point, obviously, um, we have the decommissioning saga, which was allowed to be protracted and which Republicans bagged concessions. We've had the on the runs assurances. We've had the Royal Progress of Mercy. And we've had a range of all the things that have been done. Is that in itself a reason why we must now close down this process? Because this state has such a porous law when it comes to the issue of terrorism? I would submit not. And I would feel that it needs to be said, uh, Michael, that this is not purely an issue for Northern Ireland. There were almost 500 members of the regular army murdered in Northern Ireland. And we have to look to their families and what this is going to mean for them. And never have we yet received any confirmations or assurances that terror organisations are in a place where they are going to engage with good faith with these structures. Many know why their loved ones were murdered. They were deemed to be legitimate targets. They want to know who was involved in those murders because it has been absolutely destroying them psychologically down the years. Was my neighbour involved? Who exactly was part and parcel of this? And Michael, the critical point in all this, I'm not going to get into the law today because many have indicated that this process is indeed illegal. I'm not going to get into that. But what I am going to get into is we're asking victims and survivors to present themselves to a process to be complicit with a, an immunity being offered to those who have engaged in these crimes, because only when they start the process can that then happen. Imagine the difficulties there will be in families where there are different issues between siblings and their approaches. Imagine multi-atrocity cases where there are very divergent views. Let, let this will not be a good situation. 
Let me put that to Danny Kinahan. Um, it, it is, of course, a, a very good point. Do we really think that engaging in this truth process, whereby someone would discover perhaps, perhaps, uh, how their loved one was murdered, is that any kind of substitute for justice? I don't think it is a substitute for justice, but it, it's sort of not, not where we are. Most veterans want the system at the moment, want something better than is there at the moment, because it is also one-sided. The government have come up with an alternative. It's not my alternative. It's what they've come up with and working through, and we've lobbied through and hardened it to make sure we get prosecution back in there, because I'm representing somewhere around 120 to 150,000 Northern Ireland veterans. And they, of course, all have different views. So we asked them what they, they thought, and 90% want something different from what we've got today. But when you come down to a body that's going to take it all on board, that dropped to 58%. Now, this was with the original bill before prosecution was brought back in for where someone has been given immunity and lied, and therefore has immunity taken away. But it also is we have the system coming in because the courts weren't coming up with any information for families in that evidence was often being told it was under duress, as with soldiers A and C, and therefore the families didn't find out what happened. The idea, as I understand it behind this, is the truth and is the reconciliation side. It's to try and get the truth to what happened. And it therefore became vital to get prosecution back into it. If we get it all in place and it works, I have a qualified support for it. But I have, you know, we're nervous of it. It is really hard to deal with legacy. Dan, Dan, Danny Kinahan and Kenny Donaldson, um, it's a most interesting issue. Um, I think it's disappointing to all of us to know that the legacy is still so bitterly contested. But I do think that it's something that people in Great Britain need to know about. And therefore, I'm very pleased that you come on GB News to discuss it. In a few moments, I'll chat with the man helping vegans to avoid meat eaters in the dating scene. Before that, here are your latest news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Hi there, it's 12.30. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. The French government will hold emergency talks later to address the civil unrest after a fifth night of rioting, with violent clashes taking place in Marseille. And more than 700 people have been arrested following looting and demonstrations in a number of other cities. There was a huge police presence in Paris last night protecting the Champs-Élysées. The riots began after the police shot and killed the teenager Nahel Merzouk during a traffic stop in Paris on Tuesday. The police will have new powers to crack down on environmental activists that come into force today. They'll have a greater ability to move on static protests and demonstrators could be charged with tunnelling or being present in a tunnel to cause disruption. That will become a new criminal offence and that could result in up to three years in jail. The Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, says it's necessary to deal with what she's described as mayhem on the streets. Environmental campaigners such as Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion say it threatens their right to protest. Labour says it would give teachers in England £2,400 to stop them leaving the profession. The party's promising £50 million a year in an effort to prevent an exodus uh, of teachers funded by ending tax breaks for private schools. Nearly one in five teachers who qualified in 2020 have since quit. Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson says the problem really needs to be addressed. And rail passengers will face further disruption over the next week. ASLEF members at 16 train companies in England will refuse to work overtime. Operators rely on that to run their full timetable. The union says it's still calling for fair pay, but the rail delivery group says ASLEF rejected its last offer of a £5,000 raise, which would bring the basic salary for a driver working a four-day week to nearly £65,000. Uh, services will be disrupted from Monday to Saturday. Uh, more on all of our stories on our website. But that's it for the moment. Now, back to Michael. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, picture the scene. You've brought uh, the vegan that you're dating to dinner at your parents' house for the first time, only to find out that mum has splashed out on succulent steaks. Well, one man is trying to avoid such embarrassment. He's been a vegan for over 10 years, and in 2016, he gave up a career in filmmaking to invest his savings in a dating app 
for vegans. It's called Grazer and its slogan is the meatless matchmaker. Lewis Foster, thank you very much for joining us. Um, is this a, a, a real problem? Can, can a vegan be happy with a non-vegan? Well, yeah, it is a big problem. Over half of vegans wouldn't date a meat eater and a quarter of vegans and vegetarians have broken up with a partner because of uh, the difference in, in, in diet. So it ranks really highly when it comes to you know, dating preferences. And uh, so first of all, is it, is it, uh, it's a social thing, is it? I mean, a vegan can't really bear to be sitting day after day at breakfast, lunch and dinner while the non-vegan partner is uh, consuming dairy products and, and meat. I would say it's a, it's a practical issue, but it's also an ethical issue. If um, you don't eat meat for ethical reasons, you might find it hard sitting across from a, a plate that has um, steak or, or whatever on it. So I think ethics are probably the, the biggest friction um, uh, for, for that kind of uh, dynamic, yeah. We're, we're in the middle of the day, long before any threshold, but I mean, are things like kissing an issue? Yeah, I mean, a lot of vegans say they wouldn't kiss um, someone just after eating a, a burger or whatever. And is a kiss when someone's got, say, animal fat on their mouth, is that a vegan kiss? I, it's, it's, it's arguable. So, um, yeah, lots of vegans would be put off by that fact. And that's also a big thing for what we're doing. Not only do you date to find a partner, but you might be looking to hook up with someone and, and have fun. And a lot of vegans say they, they wouldn't want to have fun with a, a meat eater. So, um, I, I have a sort of moral and ethical question about this as well, though, which is, you know, if we're constantly trying to find people who are almost identical to ourselves, isn't that kind of against what society is about? Isn't society about mixing different sorts of people and exchanging ideas and even ideologies? Yes, yeah, 100%. But I would also say any movement uh, relies on the success of being well-connected. And we do need more of a vegan bubble. Um, one of the biggest problems we have is that 84% of vegans in the US, this is 84% of vegans and vegetarians go back to eating meat. And the biggest reason is because of a lack of support network. Hmm. So what we're trying to do is increase um, that support network directly and solve that problem, which is, I, I would argue, the biggest problem that the meat-free movement faces. Why was Grazer necessary? I mean, I assume on dating apps you can tick boxes that uh, tell you that you're a that tell others that you're a vegan. Yeah, you can. Um, over half of vegans and vegetarians don't mention it on their profile. So if you're a vegan or vegetarian on mainstream dating apps, you might be swiping by people that you might be really well aligned with. Um, and then you also might match with a meat eater. And when you have the discussions about your dietary or ethic uh, ethical point of view, then it might bring up a debate which you don't want to have. So um, we're trying to house everyone in, 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 one, in one location, not only dating, but friend finding. So 20% uh, of our users use our friend finding feature. And, what we're trying to do is build more of a social hub for the meat-free movement. And you've talked about um, people feeling a lack of support, but actually, isn't veganism on the increase? Yes, it's on the increase, but we're still a minority. So in the UK, around 3 to 6% are vegan, around 10% are vegetarian. Tesco's did a study that said 25% of Brits will be vegan or, or vegetarian by 2025, but I think that's um, a bit inflated. But um, there is, I mean... In, in, in cities, we have a, a higher density, but imagine being, you know, vegan somewhere where, you know, in, in a, a farm area, you're not really going to find someone <laughs> around you that is like that. No. And that's where you might well have to turn to uh, Grazer. Thank you very much, uh, Lewis Foster. After the break, I'll be transported in spirit to the slopes of Mount Etna in Sicily through the medium of gelato. Stay with us. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Weeknights on GB News from 6 p.m. You'll always get drama. Please stop, Michelle. I'm going, oh, yeah. Please <laughs> stop. So I just shut off? Romance. You like me, I like you. There you oh, go. There you are. Well, don't tell anybody. We've got Adventure. Da 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 dum, etc. Yeah, that's but, the whole point. But, 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 oh. And action. Shut up. Oh. Read my superstar panel. They're already at it. They're fighting. It's going to be quite a show. Only on GB News. Britain's watching. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. The Caliendo family be began making gelato in this country almost a century and a half ago. The present generation's outlet has been named UK Parlour of the Year. The award comes from the Ice Cream Alliance. But, but as I found out when I visited the Caliendo's Parlour in North London, it makes gelato. There's an old song that goes, you say tomato and I say tomato and it's about distinctions of no importance. But I say ice cream and you say gelato, that's a difference that really matters. Come into the lab, Michael. The lab. Now, Michelina, when I went to university for my interview, the first question they said was, how Italian are you, Mr. <laughs> Portillo? Which I'm not, I'm Spanish. But may I ask you, how Italian are you, Michelina? So I'm actually third generation British. Really? Yes, so my ancestors came over in the 1800s. Now the paperwork that we've found goes back to about 1880, but it could have been slightly before that. Did they come to make gelato? We think so, because actually on the paperwork it does say ice cream vendor and confectioner. So whether they thought they could have other trades when they got over here, I'm not sure, but every generation of our family has made gelato. And did they come from a, a mountain village? They did, yes. <laughs> so just outside of Naples, it was a little village. Do you speak Italian? Um, I speak a little bit of Italian, not as much as I should, but I do understand quite a lot. Mm, good. Yeah. Now, I have been told there's a difference between gelato and ice cream. There is a very important difference. Not many people know it. A gelato is actually made with more milk and less cream. And uh -huh. I'm going to show you this is our pasteurizer that has our milk, cream and sugars all mixed together. So if you extract some out of there for me. That's it. Just lift the handle up. Ooh. Look at that. But that looks quite creamy, Michaela. It is. It's very creamy. What have you done to this already, then? We have aged it for quite a long process to make sure that all the ingredients have emulsified together. And what ingredients have they been so far? Milk, sugar, cream, and some emulsifiers, emulsifiers and stabilizers. Right, and so this is our building block. It is indeed. This is what we call the foundation of our gelato, the fior de latte. Fior de latte, the, yeah. the, the flour of the milk. Exactly. Va bene. We are going to make what we consider one of the finest ingredients in the world, Bronte pistachio. Mm. 
Do you know, I adore pistachio. It's, it's absolutely one of my favorite things. It, it's not just what the Italians do, but you know what the entire Arab world does with pistachios. Yes. I adore what they do with pistachios. So, a little known fact is that the finest pistachios come from Bronte in Sicily. Really? So most people think of uh, Arabs, uh, Turkish, but on the slopes of Mount Etna is where all the pistachio groves grow and they're harvested only every two years and they're hand-picked because of the volcanic uh, slopes. So it's a really labor-intensive thing, but the nut itself is smaller, sweeter, and more intense. And as you can see, it's got this gorgeous green color. In the region, it's known as green gold, and it's actually harvested under armed guard. That's absolutely fantastic. Do you think all that volcanic dust gives it the flavor? That's exactly what it is. is it, really? it adds to the minerals and, uh, and the flavor and the nutrients inside. I love it when I get something right. So we are going to pour some of the pistachio paste into the milk base. What sort of quantity? Around 400 grams. So I'm watching the dial. Just that little dollop there, that should do it. Great, Ooh, perfect. Dear. A moment. Wonderful. Ooh. Okay, and because there's such a high fat content in the nuts, we just have to add some uh, sugars to it just to balance the gelato, otherwise it would be too firm. We'll pop that in as well. That's and by the way, this is what you actually do, is it? Every day. Every day? This yeah, is, every this day, maybe 10, 12 hours a day, we make each one by hand and put it straight out the front. So it is, even though it's a frozen product, it's a really fresh product. How fantastic. How many flavors are you making each day? Uh, well, our cabinet holds 24 flavours, so we have to get 24 pans out there, and each one is a different flavour. And you're, and you're making it on this scale, in these, you know, actually quite tiny containers. Yeah. It's an artisan product. Mm. It's not mass-produced. It's not a factory, you know, where they're churning hundreds of litres out a day. No, that's glorious. What do we do to this fellow now? We're going to blend this up. So we've got a lovely machine, which my ancestors wouldn't have had, uh, where you can uh, turn it on and get everything blended quite quickly. Michelina, do you find you have to teach the public about gelato? They come here expecting ice cream. Yeah, absolutely. People don't know what they just think it, gelato is the Italian for ice cream and it's the same product. So we actually really enjoy spending time with every customer explaining what the ingredients are that we put into it, why we put those ingredients in and how we source the ingredients. So we source these pistachios direct from the farmer in Bronte and we've actually gone over there at harvest time to see the harvest and see the pistachios being picked. How wonderful. And how long have you had these premises? We've only been here three and a half years. Before that? So we've had uh, quite different careers. So I was a commercial pilot flight instructor. <laughs> so absolutely, completely different. Nothing to do with uh, uh, hospitality or food. That's amazing. Yeah. What a life change. Michelina, il momento della verità, the moment of truth. So it's been in there, it's whipped around, it's nice and cold, ready to go? It is ready to go and extract. Now, I bet you have a knack to this, so I'm going to leave it to you. You show yes, me what you do. Yes, we do, because we have to make sure that it looks visually appealing to the public as it comes out. So we gently place it into the pan. And we don't want to compress any of the air out. We want it to have a nice height to it so that it sits like pillows of joy. Pillows of joy! <laughs> <laughs> I bring you tidings <laughs> of pillows of joy. Thank you very much, Michael. Well done. Fiona. Hello, Michael. How are you? It's great to see you. So you are the front of house. I am, indeed. My goodness, what a display of gelato you have there. Just whip me through these flavours. 
So uh, we tend to separate our cabinet out. On the, uh, the left hand hand here we have our uh, sorbet selection. Anything we green handle basically is dairy free. We do a huge amount of it in the UK. We then move into our uh, sort of what we call crowd pleasers, our chocolates, amarena cherry, fior de latte, etc. And then to the right we can tend to keep our nuts. Um, and uh, I think, believe you were just making uh, some pistachio, Bronte pistachio with Magdalena. I certainly was. So if these are the crowd pleasers, are these the sophisticates? I would say so, yes. I mean, we've got some classics in there. For me, um, a classic combination would be a chocolate a pistachio, a pistachio and hazelnut, a uh, sacchitella and a uh, pistachio. They would be, most of the Italians will come in and tend to eat that. Amarena cherry, hugely popular as well. Um, and uh, as always, cafe latte. Um, what do you serve them on and in? So we use a, uh, a sort of traditional waffle cone. What is special, however, is um, our eco tubs. Now these are a fairly new thing yep. that uh, was actually uh, made and uh, patented in 2019, I think it was. Um, and basically uh, the cup is edible which is a bit of a shock that it's taken to this time to get something patented that is edible. But the, whole, the big thing about it is the whole thing will disappear in 10 days. So even the paper and everything. So if someone Wonderful. puts it into landfill in a black plastic bag, wherever, it doesn't matter, it's going to disappear in 10 days. Whereas biodegradable stuff, etc., has to be processed or will take a longer period of time. So we're completely uh, trying to transfer all our customers onto edibles. It's the uh, ultimate recyclable, as it were. Michalina tells me that she's only just recently come into the gelato business. Have you been in it all your life? No, not at all. I've, I've been an avid customer all my life. Uh, I was an army officer with the medics. Uh, I did 16 years. I then left, started up my own company doing project program management and sort of still have a little bit of a back pocket in that now. Um, but yeah, uh, so for me, it was a real, it's lovely to be in the happiness business. You know? and, and that's, you know, people come in, they might be a bit miserable, they're happy when they come in, hopefully they're very happy when they leave. Um, it's just a lovely thing to do, it's still a treat that the family can still uh, enjoy at a, at a reasonable price. And if you don't mind going back, did you, did you ever see fr frontline action? Yeah, I um, had been in uh, Sierra Leone, Angola, uh, Iraq. Um, I actually, my last tour was in Iraq, um, just w we did the withdrawal. So um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so um, interesting times. Interesting times, interesting life. Isn't it amazing the journeys you make through life? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think for me, that's the, the, the big thing about being in the army. It does make you quite adaptable because one minute you're you know, in Africa, the next you're on Salisbury Plain or you're in front of a desk presenting the paper for something. You know, So it's that sort of adaptability that I think we bring to the business. Um, and you're used to dealing with lots of people in, in lots of states of, of happiness or unhappiness, as it were. And now you hope it's always in a state of happiness. You, 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 you like interacting with the public. I love it. And, and I think it helps perhaps maybe that I'm Northern Irish, that we, you know, we do like to talk to people. So I believe in Northern Ireland, you, you speak of going for a poke yes. when you're going for <laughs> an ice cream. So I hope at no risk of being misunderstood. Could I have a poke of pistachio, please? You can. Un poco. Ah, un poco. Yes, a poke, of course. A yes, well, uh, uh, there's, that's where I think it comes from. However, I would stand to be corrected. So, pistachio, yes? Pistachio. Okay. So what we're doing here is massaging the product so that it actually warms up a little. Uh-huh. And it gives the client a much better mouthful. It looks much better. There you go. Oh, do you know, there's so much more in the way you presented that <laughs> than I could ever have imagined. Well. Now, I believe this is these wonderful pistachios, Bronte pistachios. In order to be classified as, as Bronte, uh, it has to be, uh, it's a bit like a champagne region, but for pistachios, uh, it has to be grown basically on the foothills of Mount Etna uh, in that specific reason. So it's a much smaller, much sweeter nut, and I think certainly you can taste the quality difference from normal pistachio. That is one of the great ices that I have ever licked and I am transported to the slopes of Mount Etna. Mm. Volcanic taste. Exactly, the richness of the soil coming through. I love my job. You can treat yourself to some of Caliendo's award-winning gelato.
on Kentish Town Road in North London. In a few minutes, Emily Carver will be taking over. Emily, I am so sorry not to have anything to offer you here in the studio, but I hope you enjoyed the gelato at a distance. I know, I like doing this handover on a Sunday because I usually get to taste something. Um, that pistachio flavour looks excellent. But on my show today, yes. we're going to be crossing straight to Paris mm. to see what happened last night. The interior minister in France says it was a more calm, a calmer evening, but there were still over 700 arrests. And a mayor in one Paris suburb had his house rammed while his uh, children and wife were in the home. So we're going to be seeing what's going on there, what's Macron going to do about it all. Then we'll return to Britain and look at the NHS. I know you were discussing it earlier. Is the NHS reformable? Is it savable? Um, most people seem to think it needs to be reformed and no one can quite think of what the reform would be. And certainly they can't think of how it would be politically um, uh, successful mm. or, or acceptable. You know what I find interesting is just the size of it, how many employees it has, upwards of 1.2 million. Under this plan, there'll be, what, 300, 400,000 more people working for one institution. Can any organisation that large ever be run efficiently? I want to know. Well, the, I think it's heading towards the number that are employed in the Chinese armed forces, so perhaps we should be asking the Chinese how they manage that. No, it is... And it, it, it is <laughs> A move towards authoritarianism, there we go. <laughs> it is an improbable number. Anyway, I'm sure your show will be absolutely marvellous. Um, well, uh, thank you very much to all my guests on today's show. I'll be back on the um, 16th of July, so I'll be missing you next week, and I'll miss you very, very badly. Um, I hope you have a wonderful Sunday today. I look forward to seeing you again. Goodbye for now. Hello there, I'm Greg Dewhurst and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast. We're looking at rain or showers the next few days. There'll be some bright or sunny spells. Rather chilly, but it does start to warm up later in the week. And we can see with the bigger picture, low pressure sat to the northeast of the UK. We've got a cool northwesterly breeze, quite gusty around the coasts and outbreaks of showery rain pushing across the country too. So to end the day, we do have showers across the northern half of the UK, some of these still heavy, some more persistent rain moving from Orkney into the mainland northern parts of Scotland here. Clearer spells overnight developing further south, but still some scattered showers moving in and temperatures for most of us tonight holding up in double figures. So a brighter start Monday morning compared to Sunday. Yes, we'll already have showers across the north and the west. This spell of Heavier, more persistent rain will slowly push its way eastward. Some uncertainty with the exact positioning of this, but we could see some heavy downpours and some rumbles of thunder within that. To the south, generally quite cloudy, some sunny spells, but also scattered showers. Showers further north too, and then this rain still continuing to sink south across Scotland. And for many, quite a chilly afternoon. Temperatures generally the high teens to very low 20s. Further showers to end Monday, this rain starting to fragment a little bit, but still pushing southwards across Scotland with further showers behind it. And then overnight into Tuesday morning, perhaps some more persistent rain moving into southern parts of England. Much needed rain across this part of the world. Temperatures generally again holding up in double figures. So a cloudy wet start across southern counties of England and Wales likely on Tuesday morning. Some heavy bursts possible as this system slowly pushes its way southeastwards, followed by sunshine and showers for the rest of the day. Further showers and rain on Wednesday, but perhaps drier and warmer by Thursday. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this.